The White Ribbon The whistle sounded, and the train pulled out of the station of the small town Cassie had called home for her short eight years of life. Cassie looked out the train's window and watched the town get smaller and smaller. Finally, when there was nothing left to see aside from fields of grass, Cassie turned her attention back to her surroundings. The wagon was cramped. People were packed in like sardines on top of each other. Cassie was forced to sit on the lap of her older sister, while her mother bounced her two younger brothers on her knees. Cassie's father, John, remained standing. Cassie couldn't keep from wondering what it was like to travel in the privileged first-class wagons, the ones the white people rode in. Cassie had seen them from the train's platform as they boarded. The wagons were almost empty, and they looked to be far more comfortable than the narrow, cramped space with hard plastic benches Cassie's family had been made to ride in. Cassie sighed and tried not to think about how their new life in the big city would be. Their father found a job at a shoe factory in Boston. He moved there a year earlier. He'd only returned to secure passage for them and help them move into the big city. Cassie didn't like it, but she knew that she should always be respectful and grateful to her parents, so she never voiced her opinions to any of them. Are we there yet? Her youngest brother, Billy, complained. They had been traveling for the better part of the day, and they were getting tired and hungry. Cassie had tried to sleep, but she found it impossible with the heat and lack of space. She felt claustrophobic and wished they would arrive in Boston soon, too. At last, under a cloudy, moonless sky, the train pulled into the train station. The train station was huge and pulsed with activity. Cassie bounced her leg impatiently as the whites got off, then she was forced to wait some more for them to retrieve their things. At last, it was Cassie's family to disembark. The year was 1922, and segregation laws were being enforced more than ever. Cassie was too young to understand what those laws meant, but she knew that whites and blacks were not allowed to mix. They attended different schools, went to separate restrooms, parks, and even drank from different water fountains. At Cassie's small town, segregation wasn't that strongly enforced. Cassie's community was composed mostly of black families. Cassie never minded these segregation laws. Hold hands and stay together, Cassie's mom warned as they got off the train and made their way out of the train station. On their short drive to their new home, an apartment on a musty building, Cassie noticed how whites and blacks kept their distance. Even on the bus, they were forced to sit at the back. Meanwhile, the whites took the front seats. Cassie couldn't stop thinking of this strange behavior. She hoped it would be slightly different at school. Two days later, Cassie got her answer. She entered her classroom and was surprised to find so many white children already seated. She looked for a black child, but saw none, so she proceeded to find a seat. What are you doing? A red-haired girl asked. Cassie looked at her puzzled, not sure how to reply. Blacks sit on the back of the room, the girl sneered, jabbing a finger towards the cluster of dirty-looking, broken desks by the back of the classroom. Cassie looked at the collection of desks and frowns. Most were broken with crooked legs, and their surfaces were covered with stains and pencil drawings. The school was too overcrowded for separate classes, so they had to put the children in the same classrooms while still forcing the segregation laws. Cassie hoped that there would be other black children in the class, but as the bell rang, no other children showed up. When the teacher introduced Cassie to the class, everyone looked at her as if she was an odd creature. Some looked at her with disdain, others with open curiosity, but none dared to come close or offer her friendship. The rest of the week wasn't any better. 
Cassie considered asking her parents more than once to let her move back home with her grandparents. But again, the remarks of being respectful and grateful kept her quiet. Boston was a gray city with tall buildings and little trees. There were a few sunny days, and the air was cold and smelled of fumes. Cassie missed the open countryside, the tall trees, colorful flowers, blue skies, and freshly scented air. She missed the friendly greetings and smiles that she encountered on her way to school every morning. Most of all, she missed her friends and family. Can I sit here? A brown-haired girl with the greenest eyes Cassie had ever seen asked. Cassie jumped startled and fell off the broken chair she sat on. Cassie looked with wide eyes around the cafeteria, her heart beating wildly. Did anyone see it? Cassie thought as she got to her feet and looked at the girl who stood by the table, smiling sweetly at her. Cassie shook her head and said in a soft voice, Please, don't. You will get in trouble. The girl shrugged and set her lunch tray down. She took out a book, placed it beside her food, and asked, Do you like reading? Cassie nodded, unable to say much. She couldn't stop looking at the girl. With so many students crowding the cafeteria, the teachers hardly noticed. The students were too engaged in their talk and games to pay any attention to the two girls. For weeks, Cassie and the girl, whose name was Betty, sat at the old lunch table on the far corner. At first, they didn't talk much, but eventually, they began speaking in hushed voices, reading together, and getting to know one another. Cassie struggled with understanding why blacks and whites had to be separated when they were no different. Do you want to come to my home? Betty asked one rainy afternoon as school ended. You can go home when the rain stops. Cassie thought about it and was about to shake her head when Betty took her hand and pleaded, You won't get in trouble, I promise. My family isn't like everyone else. These last words she said while making a hand gesture to her surroundings. Cassie nodded and was glad to spend an afternoon playing with their friends. Betty was very welcoming and so was her mother and older siblings. Betty's father was more reserved, but he too made Cassie feel welcome. As night fell, the father took Cassie back to her home. Her family was very surprised but thankful and happy for their daughter. Cassie's and Betty's friendship blossomed until one day, a teacher caught Cassie and Betty walking together out of school. This just isn't done, the school's principal raged at the girls. You are a well-educated, smart child that comes from a good family. You should know better than to befriend someone like her, the principal said to Betty, glancing at Cassie as if she was a dirty mouse. Cassie felt terrible for getting Betty in trouble. For associating with a white student and breaking the laws, Cassie was expelled from the school. The next public school was too far, Cassie was too little to go to it alone, and her parents couldn't take her. Cassie would have to drop out and find a job like so many poor children of the time did. I'll homeschool her, Betty's mother said the following week to Cassie's parents, but it must be done discreetly. That was how, while everyone went to work and school, Cassie went to Betty's home, making sure she wasn't followed or seen. She took a different route every day. Sometimes she stopped at the market or the small park in case she was being watched. Meanwhile, Betty and Cassie became the best of friends. They didn't care about their racial differences or laws. They knew deep down they were the same, regardless of skin color, culture, or beliefs. One Christmas, Betty gave Cassie a white silk ribbon. Cassie giggled, for she thought of the same and handed Betty a black silk ribbon. The two had been making them in secret with Cassie's mom's help. This will remind me of you always, Cassie said, putting the ribbon on her hair. Betty smiled, best friends forever. Despite segregation laws and restrictions, the two remained friends throughout their teen and adult years. They joined the fight for equality and civil rights, 
for they believed that people should have the same opportunities in life and be allowed to socialize and cohabitate, regardless of race, nationality, or culture.